This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I think people might drift in maybe. We're just, uh, it's just gone 5.45, so we'll see. And we're going to turn the lights out. We can either have light, light, but I don't think you'll see the slides if we have yeah. the lights on. Maybe in comparison, that's A. <laughs> <laughs> B. we've got the light in the corridor and a little bit of light coming. Outside, so we'll see how we go. And actually, uh, Tim does, Tim's coming on last, actually. He doesn't have any slides, so by the time the light fades, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be okay. Um, so I'm not going to say very much because um, it's not really my field, scientific archives, but we had an arts archive seminar last year, and it was really successful, and we had a great time talking about the latest things in, in relating to archives about the arts. And we thought we'd try and do something similar uh, this time about archives relating to science. And so we've got Polly Parry and we've got Susan Gordon, <coughs> Tim Powell, who uh, all from the uh, Natural History Museum, from UCL, from Wellcome, and from National Archives, all with an interest in scientific archives. So we're going to sort of kind of lead the debate, as it were. And then hopefully everyone do come in. Uh, everyone will, will pitch in, hopefully, after, after you've uh, talked to us about the latest developments in your areas. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Polly. Yeah. All right, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Polly. I'm the, <coughs> the information manager at the Natural History Museum. I was, for many years, the archivist. Um, and I've now moved over into the IT department, um, primarily with a focus on digital uh, records management, but in order to be sort of picking up other things along the way and um, compliance and data protection and that sort of <coughs> stuff as well. So I'm slightly talking with my, well, a combination of my old hat and my new hat, I suppose. Um, so it's some, some of my knowledge of the archives bits is slightly out of date, but. Right, I thought I'd just do a little bit of background um, at the Natural History Museum being a fairly famous place. Um, originally, we were part of the British Museum, um, which was founded by Sir Hans Sloane, um, 17th century um, gentleman of uh, fairly wealthy means by the end of it. Um, he went to Jamaica in the late 17th century where he um, started collecting natural history specimens. He brought back um, the recipe for milk chocolate, which was acquired by Cabris. Uh, later on, um, and he actually married very. He married very well, a wealthy widow, and then actually became a very good uh, physician in his own right. Uh, so he had the money to spend, and he spent it as people did if they had the money in those days on collecting things, absolutely everything. Um, so he left that to the nation uh, when he died in 1753 as the core of the new British Museum. Um, but by the mid-19th century, uh, the building, the second building, which is the one that we know today, was bursting at the seams. So they decided to move the natural history collections um, off to a separate site. So this is the plan um, that Richard Owen, who was the superintendent of the natural history departments, submitted in 1859 to the trustees. Um, his, I mean, it's very much uh, his ideas about the split between extinct and living animals. Um, but what I always like about this is this how similar it is really to what we ended up with. Because if you just convert the circular areas in the middle into oblongs, you have basically got the, pretty much the layout of the modern museum. Um, it was very much, uh, Owen wanted to, to have that central space as the introduction to what else you would find in the museum. Um, and then they bought the site in 1863. So it didn't take, I mean it took a lot of schmoozing on his part, but it didn't take that long in, in some ways. So this is what we ended up with. This is the 1872 um, floor plan, the ground, uh, the ground floor. And as you can see, you've still got the central space and you've got the long galleries and the galleries leading off. Um, to the extent that the Owens influence is so significant, that, that gallery there, the Shell Gallery, is going back one, that was pretty much exactly the same space as Owen had designated the Mollusks Gallery in 1859. Um, the design competition was 1864, but the winner died and Alfred Waterhouse took over in 1866. Um, and the construction started in 1873 until 1880. Um, the trivia fact that I like to quote is if you look at the outside of the museum, all the um, carvings or the modelling on the west side, which is the left-hand side, are all living animals. On the east side, they're all extinct, which reflected what the floor plan was when it first opened. So you really, as soon as you walked from the gates, you were getting the introduction to what you're about to see inside. Um, it opened in 1881, Easter Monday, and it was actually part of the British Museum right up until 1963. Uh, known as the British Museum of Natural History, as you can see there. Um, and it didn't become the Natural History Museum until 1992. 
Um, so, but everyone knew it was that for, for a long time before that. But significantly, and I think probably significantly in terms of data sharing, it's not just a museum. It's actually a major international scientific research institution. Um, over 300 scientists um, working there um, in our earth and life sciences and core research labs. Um, and they publish over 700 uh, scientific papers a year with international collaborators. <clears throat> so, to the archive side of it, this is, a this is one of the earlier letters we've got. Um, most of what there is is mid-19th century onwards, but it does the collection does date back to the late uh, 18th century. Um, <clears throat> so, they are the records of the museum. Um, so the archives is part of the library and archives department um, but the library also has a special collection section which is where the deposited and collected manuscripts are so like Darwin and Wallace that sort of thing they'll be in at the library rather than the archives <coughs> um, so in terms of what there is it's uh, minutes of the trustees which are the major resource um, for finding out what went on because in the past they dealt with a lot more of the minutiae of the museum business than they do today um, masses of correspondence, accession records, um, expeditions, um, including Scots to um, Antarctic expeditions, we've got records from. Um, scientific research, usually from individual scientists when they retire, but stuff does occasionally come through. Um, development of the exhibitions, um, the ephemera, like the posters, the leaflets, the postcards that were produced, photographs, um, thousands of photographs, um, and architectural plans, and some staff records, not, not by no means all. Um, we have Calm as a catalogue, um, and actually we have two people here who <laughs> know that intimately, um, and that's available on the museum website. Um, typical researchers, um, staff, other museums, academics, whether that's students or uh, scientists, historians, general public, family historians, um, novelists, artists. Uh, typical queries would be tracing origins and history of specimens. Um, of the expeditions, the history of the museum, the architecture, um, and then increasingly looking for images or items to use in displays, talks, publications, and merchandising. We're about making the money now, unfortunately. Um, up to 100 inquiries a month, and about 25, approximately, researchers um, to supervise. Um, luckily, the library um, <coughs> reading room accommodates them, so the archivists don't have to spend their entire time uh, just watching readers. So, on to the data sharing. Um, as a, the, the museum has a number of expectations and requirements on it um, for data sharing and accessibility, multiple sources, multiple reasons. Um, as a public record producing body, we've got the Public Records Act. As a public authority, we're subject to freedom of information and the reuse of public sector information regulations. As an NDPB, we've got the government's transparency and gender and open data policy. As a scientific research institution, we have research council's requirements and general scientific community expectations on the fact that you should be sharing your data. Um, and as an internationally recognised museum and scientific institution, our own aims and ambitions and vision for what we want to do is really underpinned by the fact that we are sharing our knowledge, wanting to challenge the way people think about the world, um, stimulate public debate, equip our audiences with an understanding of science, um, using a unique combination of our collection expertise and public reach. Um, so it's that kind of thing. We want to put stuff out there um, to engage with the public. This um, page is our new website section on data, um, which is where um, material is being pushed through now. <clears throat> it's scientific research and collections information, um, specimens and a little bit of manuscript, although it is separate from the library and archives, um, which have their own um, section of the web page, the website, which I'll come on to later. But from here, you can access the data portal. Um, so this is primarily for scientific output. Um, it's the collections of information, data sets, images, research, um, from our scientists. Um, it's material that we might once have got into the archives on paper, but quite possibly not because scientists kept hold of it in the department. Um, and in, in, the, in the data portal's team own words, um, a platform for deposition and discovery of NHM collections and data to promote innovation and collaboration through easy access and reuse of NHM data. Uh, it integrates with our collection design, the specimen collection management system. Um, it's stable, citable, it has stable, citable identifiers, 
on data sets and records to measure impact, and it's technically sustainable. Um, and it serves external portals um, of um, scientific information, so the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, GBIF, and the Encyclopedia of Life, just to name two. It includes the output of the Digital Collections <coughs> Programme, which is a major initiative um, to digitise a quarter of our 80 million specimens over the next five years, um, making available the most important natural history collection as a digital resource um, with an online specimen or lot level database of all holdings uh, with core metadata and or images for key parts of the collections and flexible informatics tools. Um, so it was approved in November 2013 with three pilot projects and it's just finishing the first phase and it's just got funding for phase two. So you've already got um, things coming through on the data portal of the, the e Mesozoic um, project, for instance, which was digitising British fossils from the Mesozoic period. Um, so there is um, a big drive in terms of scientific um, output to really push that out into the public domain. It doesn't cur currently deliver archives content, um, but it hasn't been ruled out as a potential source. Um, but as with all these things, because we have no absolute solution at the moment, it requires some investigation as to whether actually it would be at all appropriate. But it is there as a possible. <clears throat> but from that, the first data page I showed you, there are links to about 28 databases, I think I counted, mainly from the old website, because we upgraded, um, I think it was last year. Some of those are on biodiversity, so algae, British mosses, um, bumblebees of the world, that sort of thing, but also some on the collections themselves. So you've got a couple of herbarium collections, so the press plant volumes, um, and uh, specific collection specimen data, so um, <coughs> microfossils or bird types. But the one I'm going to talk about is the Wallace Letters, because that's the, the, the sort of pure manuscript collection, as it were. The Wallace Letters Online is the output from the Wallace Correspondence Project, um, which was, well, the website was launched in January 2013 as part of the centenary year for Wallace's um, death. Um, with the aim of, and the project has the aim to locate, digitise, transcribe and interpret all of Wallace's correspondence and other influential manuscript material, um, including letters by his contemporaries that talk about him. So it had a pretty big scope. Um, it was externally funded by the Mellon Foundation and then the Templeton Foundation. The library um, bought the Wallace papers from the family in 2002, and then there was an addition in 2005, and they found someone in loft, as you do. Um, the collection um, was um, annotated copies of his own books, um, manuscripts, correspond correspondence, which I was absolutely massive because I was, I was sitting opposite the archivist who was, who was cataloguing them at the time and that was just absolutely massive. Um, photos and drawings relating to his scientific work um, and family and personal life. And there were some butterfly and beetle specimens from his private collection. Um, <clears throat> so the archival material was catalogued onto the archives CALM database. We got a project archivist in to do that. She's actually been a, a previous volunteer in the archives. And this formed the core of Wallace Letters Online. The Wallace Correspondence Project um, has its own website as it was externally funded, but it runs off a museum database. The CALM records were imported um, at the beginning, and it's available um, through this page. So if you do a search, uh, I think it makes very big time as well. So if you search in there for something, I did um, H.W. Bates and then just picked one of the many that came up. Again, it's very tiny, so you can't really see, but is it as an exemplar of what a record looks like, it has the record number, it's got the sent by, sent to, the date, it's got a, a summary description, um, and then you can actually see, on not all, but on some, a transcript and or a scan, or sometimes if you've got both, you can actually see them alongside each other. Um, <clears throat> and they have actually got that for the majority of entries, they have actually got a transcript and, scra and a scan, <coughs> apparently. Um, further work is currently on hold because funding ended at the current round of funding, ended in July 2015, but they'd found um, 982 letters and other documents by that point. And of those, uh, the scans were over 5,000 of them. So the total in the database now is nearly 6,000 documents and over 23,000 images. All the Wallace-related manuscripts, which the project knows about everywhere, um, have been catalogued and images have been obtained from nearly all of them. 
Um, but I think, it, I mean, it's certainly up to the point of funding ceasing and then if they ever get more funding for it, it's very much, they're always on the lookout um, for more stuff. So if you ever find any Wallace stuff in your collection, they don't know that, do let them know. So yeah, I mentioned the Library and Archives Catalogue being a separate um, entity from the data portal, the data uh, section of the website. Um, with regard to data sharing, that's probably more in the future, to be quite honest. Um, but last year they implemented a new catalogue system which can search across the Library and Archives catalogues. So there's two separate catalogue systems. Um, because it's a library system, it doesn't do hierarchy, but you can actually click on, you, you bring a record up and then you can click on it and it will show you the CALM record with the relevant hierarchy and links to the name authorities and all that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> the archives have uh, accruing a large number of scanned images um, and hopefully in the next few months we'll be actually be able to use Calm View to actually upload them um, and so we can actually start populating um, the visual side of our database. Once that's set up, um, we have a hope, you know, it might be easier to um, incorporate um, some digitisation into future cataloguing projects or vice versa, I suppose, um, and make the scans accessible, so like they've done for the Wallace project. Um, work plan for the next year is trying to establish a proper digital archive for the Born Digital, um, because we don't have that at the moment. We've got a, a small area um, on a server which, if people give us stuff, we can save there, but we can't make it accessible, um, <coughs> and it's in no um, sort of organised form in terms of the transfer process. So there's, um, being public sector, there's no plans to actually spend money on a specific project, um, so we'll have to see what we can do in-house, but um, at least the intention is there to actually create work potentially, I have heard, although I haven't followed this up yet, to actually give us a server, a whole server of our own um, to use. Um, so that's a, let's say it's a watch this space to see hopefully in a year's time we might actually have something that we can, we can use and maybe deliver again through Calm. Um, we do have um, a media asset management system, um, so a DAMS, um, which is currently being implemented, and that may again, like the data portal, is something for us to investigate as to whether that might be something we can use to deliver um, image content. Um, but again, we need to investigate what that would actually mean. Um, and I, finally, I should also mention the library's involvement with the Biodiversity Heritage Library, um, which the museum was heavily involved in the setup of it's an international consortium of natural history and botanical libraries um, in partnership with the Internet Archive digitising the legacy literature of biodiversity. Um, so public domain books and journals out of copyright um, or in some cases where they've managed to obtain a copyright um, or put copyright permissions. Um, and they've now got almost a thousand titles um, and over seven thousand volumes digitised from the museum's um, published material collection doesn't include special collections and archives and I'm not sure that it's actually ever the intention to but just in terms of making our collections available that is definitely up there as one of the things that the museum is doing. So, on that note, <laughs> come up. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit of an idea about, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, build it up and it's just a question mark, um, I hope that's given you a bit of an idea about where we've come from and where we're going. Um, I think there's lots of potential um, we just need to find resources to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly. I think what we did last year was we, we waited until the end of all three, and then we had like sort of group questions. So maybe we could do that again this year, and then we could kind of go through all three. So if people have got any questions for Polly, just hold on to them, and we'll bombard them at you for a while. <laughs> and so we'll go on to our next speaker, Susan Gordon. Or should I put your slide up for you? So. Um, is that all right? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I guess you may have been able to surmise from the topic, from the title of my talk, is that um, I'm someone who, up until recently, up until last, um, had, was been a scientist, and I guess it's debatable whether one can ever stop being a scientist, <laughs> even if they transition <laughs> to another career. There's considerable amount of enculturation that goes on there. Um, so I trained as a geneticist and worked as a geneticist until mm, last September, I think, 
Uh, and I'm now involved in a program where I do half-time archives trainee at Wellcome Trust, and I'm also doing the Masters of Archives and, Rest and Records Management at UCL part-time as well. So very, very good opportunity for someone who wants to transition from a scientist to an archivist. Um, and so basically I was told for this talk I could just talk about anything that might give some insight. <laughs> um, and so basically what I'm going to talk about is kind of all the things that were told to me when I was being trained and working as a scientist about record keeping and why it's important to scientists. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how scientists feel about their data and how that might vary depending on the particular discipline that the scientist is working in. Um, okay, so just for the 50% of you approximately in the room who don't know me, so what do I? Clicking on that one hand there, Oh, okay. It just seems to be very slow. <laughs> Hang on, actually, it's come up. Yeah, you do, you take that off. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so just to get an idea of where my perspective comes from. So after doing undergraduate study, also in genetics, um, I did my PhD in at the University of Toronto, the Department of Molecular Medical Genetics. And but I think notably, I worked. My research was based in a hospital research institute, um, and so I worked on kind of very basic laboratory bi biology, uh, genetics, molecular biology, protein biochemistry, looking at um, the pathways that um, underlie a rare human genetic disorder. And so after doing that for a few years, I was a bit sick of it. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> for my postdoctoral studies, I decided to do something quite different, something that I'd looked at a bit more during my undergraduate days. Um, so I went to a environmental research institute, um, also in Canada. And I looked at things like um, DNA barcoding, which is part of a biodiversity monitoring in initiative, uh, molecular phylogenetics, which is about reconstructing evolutionary trees, the tree of life kind of thing, uh, and population genetics, which is a branch of evolutionary genetics, and working on mostly aquatic species because it was a, kind of the focus of the institute I was working in. And so I think notably, notably this was a combination of, whereas my first my first kind of research experience in grad school was based, based mostly laboratory based. This was a kind of combination 50-50 of laboratory and computational <coughs> biology. And from then, I, um, I really enjoyed doing that. I like the environment, I like the work. It's horrifically, horrifically poorly funded. <laughs> and so I decided to go on, um, come over here and start and do some work at the European Bioinformatics Institute because I liked the computational biology side, what I was doing. And so I worked for the Hugo Gene Nomenclature Committee. And this was more kind of in what's called the field of biocuration, which I'll talk about a bit more. And it's like looking at uh, analyzing gene sequences, trying to determine their function and to try to determine what's the most appropriate nomenclature for them because it's a standardized nomenclature um, for vertebrate genes depending on their function. And then from there, I went back to North America to Caltech in Pasadena, California. And I worked more computational biology, um, working on the structural and functional genome annotation, mostly of um, echinoderm species, which are like sea urchins, sea cucumbers, starfish, things like that. And so then, so this was mostly, um, so as I say, genome annotation. So structural genome annotation is um, actual structure of genes, how they occur within the genome, and then functional gene an annotation is doing analysis on them and trying to assign metadata to them to describe them better. So that's a bit more, actually a bit more than I wanted to talk about myself, <laughs> but I thought it's kind of my, gives some insight into what I'm going to talk about now. So first of all, looking at when I was training and doing my research, some of the things that were conveyed to me and that I noticed about why scientists keep records. So obviously you need to, you need to keep records to be able to do your data analysis and report your publicate and report your findings. The publication, publish or perish is very important. Also to allow for reflection on past work, which is I think kind of another way of saying it might be to make sure you don't keep making the same mistake over and over and over again and not realizing it. Um, to refute allegations of research misconduct if they arise. 
can't prevent them, you can refute them, um, and to support intellectual, intellectual property claims. And being trained in a human genetics environment, this was a big, big deal. Um, and then you want to be able to instantiate in the agreements you have with collaborator, collaborators about partnerships and authorships and things like that. Um, you know, say somebody agrees to do something, get it in writing. And then to meet regulatory, regulatory guidelines, things like um, working with radioactivity, with biohazardous materials, uh, obviously working with human subjects is a whole different stratosphere. And then also with regards to funding requirements, which is becoming more and more a thing these days with the requirement of research data management plans. So I think overall, what we can say about these motivations is they look at these records, scientists often look at the records as being something that's for their own use or for their own protection, as opposed to something that's for posterity. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, like I was saying, it's a publish or perish world, um, and your published work is what you is what is often viewed as the contribution to posterity, as well as any resources experimental resources people generate, like standardized protocols or um, cell lines or experimental tools or things like that. Uh, and I think that data is often viewed as, in laboratory science, as kind of a single purpose, single use kind of thing. Um, and this is, I think, exacerbated by the fact that a huge proportion of research effort in laboratory science doesn't result in data fit for publication. Like if 10% of what you do results in something is useful, that's fantastic. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why published data and getting published data is like so important. And I think there's a feeling that um, a lot of a lot of scientists that if unpublished results or data are no longer of use to the investigator, they might not be of use to anyone. Um, and then there's a question of, I have a few questions that I'm asking along the way here that I'm really, have to admit, I don't know the answer to. I think there just may be points for discussion is how does this kind of attitude extend to other unpublished materials like correspondence, um, re unpublished research reports and that kind of thing. And what factors might mediate this view? Because I mean, I noticed that when I see scientists, seeing scientists retiring or switching focus, moving to another institute, they go to such lengths to make sure their cell lines, their inbred animal strains, their, all their reagents have good homes. But then there's these giant recycling bins outside their office <laughs> where everything else is getting chucked into. And I think there's one thing, other than a sign, an archivist going up to them and saying, please, please, please don't throw out your stuff, what are things that might mediate scientists' views of this? And I think, I hear I'm thinking things like how groundbreaking their research has, is considered to be, um, how self-important they are, how attitude they have of themselves, um, and maybe just also how much they know about archives and the role of archives. Um, as you can imagine, sometimes as scientists, like epidemiologists or something like that, they might know quite a bit, but a lot of scientists don't have really a lot of exposure to archives at all. So then, during the second my, part of my career, I was involved in what I would call like bigger data projects, because I think big data, I mean, if you look like that like Hadron Research Collider and things like that, big data is a bit, uh, a bit relative. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. certainly, <laughs> bigger data projects. So I think that. Um, I would hear used examples since it's what I was really involved with bio curation. So you collect, you analyze, um, you annotate, you validate information that's relevant to biological science into a database or into a resource. And that information is, can be extracted and however the users want, arranged however the users want, and analyzed according to their individual needs. And so I think. A notable feature of this is that it's a major collaboration, large collaborative efforts, and they involve not just scientists with knowledge in a specialist subject area, it's software developers, computer scientists as well. A lot of people with experience in data modeling. So, um, and in this instance, the records that people make during their work are often automated, 
So the systems log their activities. And also I would say the generation of data and metadata, unlike in laboratory science where only a small fraction of your data is useful, this is almost 100% useful output because you're trying to generate data. You're trying to generate metadata about that data. So everything almost you do is useful. And your publication rate in the form of publishing it on a database, on a website, is close to 100%. And so how does this influence how people, sorry, feel, uh, how much this influence how people feel about their data? I think people in this field think more that their data is enduring. They intend it for it to be multiple use, all different types of use. And storage and accessibility is important, but I think the other thing in this instance is that there's a recognition that data needs to be able to evolve to meet future needs. So there may need to be updates to formats and software in order to make this older data still usable in the future. And that's quite an important mindset. And so then another question to think about is whether the high value accorded to nearly all data generated, um, does that kind of extend to all the other records the scientists have made during this project? They're all their correspondence, all their agreements, um, all their negotiations between different institutes. Um, I'm afraid probably not, <laughs> to be honest. Um, or is it, in this scenario, is it all about the data? Is it all about what was published in the form of a website? And I think that in this instance, there's a lot of further complication from the idea of collaboration and the number of people involved. I think getting one scientist to look outside the end product, the publish and perish, the data is, can be difficult, but getting like a whole large collaborative group of them to do so is like hurting cats up Mount Everest <laughs> in a blizzard or something. I don't, it's, yeah, it could be difficult. Um, and then, so just finally back to me. Um, I think some people might wonder, I mean, I notice when I tell people um, I'm meeting in the archives, like our archives world that I used to be a scientist, I think people say, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> um, kind of feel <laughs> a bit like maybe they're thinking it's more a bit strange, but um, so <laughs> that's fine, I don't mind. Um, but so why, why might someone who's a scientist decide to become an archivist? And I think, I mean, I have a lot of considerations, but I think for me, the primary one is that when you're looking around and you're looking and what, what's around you as a scientist is more interesting what's right in front of you. And the culture of science starts to seem just as interesting as the science itself. Um, and I think that there's a lot of research kind of done on things like science and society and how to get kids more interested in STEM and that kind of thing, but there's some, in, there's some research on the culture of science, but I think it's an under-researched area, and maybe focus, uh, I would be interested in focusing on trying to build resources to develop research in that area. And so there's a lot of very highly interrelated questions, there's a list, but they're more of a matrix, I would say, um, about developing uh, scientific institutions, the proliferation of scientific, scientific disciplines was, had a lot of impact on the education and training of scientists. And I talked about how the enculturation of scientists, collaboration versus competition, funding mechanisms, and assessment of research, which are always linked, and these kind of questions. So that's some of the things I'm hoping that science archives will help to answer in the future. And so that's really all I had to say. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> it's too dark to look at my watch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. And um, we'll go straight over to Tim to pull everything together. And because Tim doesn't have a, a PowerPoint, we can be dazzled by light. I would, can I just ask you, if you mind, if there's just a light switch just behind. If you can just press it once, it should come on. Great. Right. Okay, over to Tim Powell from the, the National Archives. Um, right. Well, some of you will know who I am, and some of you will be um, uh, I work in the Independent Archives team at the National Archives, um, which is part of Archives Sector Development, so we're part of the outward-facing um, work of TNA. Um, I was recruited to work at TNA 
few years ago to work on religious archives, which was a bit incongruous, really, because nearly all my career had been spent on science archives. However, that was a bit of an accident since I got into it um, while I was um, finishing a PhD in early medieval history, which is not an obvious background. Um, so I, oh, I applied for one year job and 20 years later I was beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> um, I saw that I was down to say something on science archives today, which is quite a tall order. So what I'm going to talk about, I suppose, is some impressions of science archives today. Um, the same in grace being that they're not all my impressions. Um, the background um, of, my, of my work at um, the National Archives has been that since the closure of the um, National Cataloging Unit of the Archives of Contemporary Scientists uh, in 2009, uh, a body for which I worked, um, there was an ongoing, though um, fairly low level concern in um, the Department um, for the Records of Contemporary Science and Technology. Um, the, the inputs into annual accessions to repositories exercises suggested um, the accessions of modern science collections were not extensive. Um, there was anecdotal <coughs> evidence suggesting that archival coverage of the area, which was never outstanding, was increasingly patchy, not always of high quality, and did not reflect the range of scientific activity in Britain. So in 2014, it was agreed that a proportion of my time should be spent carrying out some preliminary work to see um, if some sort of position paper could be drafted on potential TNA input into this area. Um, later, in 2014, the work was assisted by um, Dr. Sarah Marks, who was then also in our department, and she too was a scientist who'd um, become an archivist, um, again, from the biological sciences. Yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, she left the National Archives um, the following year. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the work we did and a few aspects arising from it. Um, of course, our work was informed by various sources, our experience, um, our the literature, um, but above all by visits to institutions, discussions by phone, email, and face to face with a range of interested parties, um, which include archivists, professional and honorary, historians of science, and representatives of science research councils, among, among others. We started from the assumptions, firstly, that there is no need to ensure that historically important records of contemporary science are retained in recognised repositories. Secondly, that they're made accessible to historians and other researchers. And thirdly, that currently this is not being ensured as comprehensively as it would be desired. In our course of our discussions, uh, no respondent um, disagreed with these assumptions, although some pointed out the splendid work that their institutions were doing in this area. Um, we endeavoured to give respondents um, the space to give their own views without undue influence from any agendas we had and to create a dialogue. Mm -hmm. The paper that emerged um, is 30 pages long and quite dense. It's not a survey, not a report, but as I said, more a position paper. A starting point to guide TNA um, for the, for, uh, have a, a TNA in its own strategy, but also I hope to help give some momentum to those outside TNA. I'll focus on one part of it, um, the challenges that were identified, um, because I think it's how we address these challenges, um, in how we address these challenges that we need to look at new approaches or perhaps update traditional ones. Um, anyone who's spent any time in science archives will have come across this sort of reaction expressed to Sally Horrocks as part of the BL's oral history of British science. If there's anything worth preserving, it's already been published, really. I've written for the Royal Society notes for anyone who's going to write a biographical memoir, which in my experience is a great help to the writer. So that's already been deposited at the Royal Society. I know that Charles Frank's papers have been deposited in our university library, which has an archive in the basement. 
And I know that Cecil Powell's stuff is also there, along with Brunel's notebooks. They're all stored in specially air-conditioned sorts of great sort of cylinders, this size, with great wheels on the end. Rather like a morgue, I suppose. <laughs> and the stuff is all in there. So if anything needs to be preserved, that's the place, I think, to put it, the university library. But I can't imagine anybody would want to preserve anything that I may leave behind that hasn't been published. That was Professor John Nye. Um, it's on all history of British science sciences, not, not a secret. Um, in the course of discussions, a number of challenges were posed by respondents. Um, now, ensuring our <coughs> kind of representation of any subject presents its own particular problems. Archives of science are not an exception, and it could be argued present more challenges than most. The following um, were identified as the principal ones. Firstly, the digital challenge, the form in which the bulk of records is now being created and held is more digital. There are particular problems with ingesting, preserving, and ensuring long-term access to such records, which are well known. In fact, this could in fact be broken down into a number of smaller sub-challenges. The quantity challenge. Um, we've just heard about the data and the problems there. Um, the ICT, ICT makes the generation of huge quantities of measurement and recording data the norm. Furthermore, um, desktop technology makes it easy to generate multiple copies of documents, and the email correspondence can be represented by long and repetitious chains. Then there's the engagement challenge. Again, we've been touched on, on this. The challenge of conveying to science, scientists what historical archives are and why they matter. How to ensure that Professor Nyes, who know there are such things as archives, don't put theirs in a tip or um, the contemporary equivalents pressed of it. Again, a number of sub-challenges. Then there's the contact challenge. Um, how to actually reach scientists, those with less understanding than John Nye, with the case. Um, in the first place, you may have a very good argument. How do you actually get it to them? The retention challenge. How to keep historically significant documents between their creation and use and transfer into the archives. Again, particularly with digital, this is a problem. Um, benign neglect is no longer a solution. You can't just um, stuff them in a filing cabinet and wait until retirement or death. And they open the filing cabinet and lo and behold, a bit of rust that's basically intact. The inter institutional challenge. Um, Science has been collaborative for a long, long time. The Fed at ICT has made it um, inter-institutional and international collaboration with multiple partners the norm for most projects. And two challenges were highlighted facing archivists dealing with science archives. The expertise challenge. Archivists often lack the confidence, knowledge, and or background in handling such archives. The exploitation challenge. Science archives are generally underused by researchers compared with other archives. I'll say a little more about the last two. The expertise challenge in part stems from the usual cultural and educational background of UK archivists. Um, so myself, my background is in science not even in modern history. Um, I was ground down over a period of years. Um, the content of scientific archives may be highly technical, and some archivists feel rightly or wrongly that they do not have the skills with which to undertake processing, and that acquiring sufficient understanding to do so is not something for which they have time or necessarily the inclination. But we should be clear, I think, that while the issue is exacerbated by um, the familiar problem of archivists of not having the, enough time to do all the things they would want, um, scientific archives really do present particular challenges. It's not a, it's not a illusory, illusory, but they are they can be really quite difficult. Uh, so accordingly, 
things like preparing grant applications for cataloging or other archives work on scientific archives can present itself as more of a difficulty than an opportunity, particularly where you're in a repository where you have alternative collections to look at. The exploitation challenge means it is also true that in some more general repositories, scientific archive collections are noticeably less, less used in comparison with collections in areas such as politics, literature, social history, and so on. Furthermore, much of the focus of the history of science in the UK has been on the theory from the 18th to the early 20th centuries. Whatever we may believe about the importance of preserving material now for the future, at a time when many repositories are facing pressure on space and other resources, the latent research interests of generations to come don't necessarily carry much weight. And the promotion of science archives through outreach and education activities, which can be done and has been done, is seen to present more difficulties than the material requiring less in the way of mediation. These challenges were repeatedly encountered in the discussions we had, um, and the, they feature again and again in published literature on the subject. Um, some are relatively new, the digital quantity challenges, whereas um, the engagement challenge is a long-standing one. There's always been a problem um, for archivists in connecting with scientists and explaining the interest and use of science archives for use other than other scientific research. Um, the paper goes on to discuss the challenges and point to some recommendations, which are intended as the starting point for um, further discussion. So I'm not going to talk about them um, with um, one brief exception now. Um, most of us are here today, I imagine, because we recognise that science archives are not just a source of funding headaches and cataloging backlogs. They are rewarding and important. It's a discrepancy that there are groups for religious archives, business archives, literary archives, political archives, archives of historic houses, charity and voluntary sector archives, health archives, community archives, and I've no doubt omitted some. There is a scientific archivists group, it's true, but not for what we think of as archives. And so one approach I do suggest in the paper is that we ought to be looking at whether those who do value and are interested in the science archives ought to be getting together ourselves to form a group or network. Um, not necessarily just to um, compare horror stories and difficulties, but to, perhaps to celebrate some of the interesting things that we, can, we find in science archives. I'll conclude by referring back to 1966, which a, when a British Records Association conference looked at this subject. They mentioned a number of challenges. Um, they may seem familiar. The history of the science, history of science as a discipline being heavily focused on the 17th to 19th centuries. The challenges of new technology. The fact that scientists generally worked as members of a team. The need for archive guidance for scientists, the role of the PRO, as it was then, in respect of modern scientific records, and the challenges facing archivists with no science background. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing new under the sun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you uh, to Susan and to Polly as well.